The video is specially prepared for the Akakazian channel. Greetings, friends. Everyone knows well what an inductor looks like. There are surface-mounted coils, through-hole ones with cores, without cores, of various shapes and sizes. While browsing the internet, I came across an image that roughly shows how to place inductors on a board relative to each other. In this video, I want to take a closer look at this aspect. So, if you want to learn how you can, and how you should not place inductors on printed circuit boards, make yourself comfortable, and we'll get started. Let's begin by understanding what an inductor is, and how it works. We will consider everything in the simplest terms possible. The current flowing through the coil creates a field inside, and around the coil. Energy is stored in this field, meaning, similar to capacitors that store energy between their plates. Inductors store energy in this field. The further we are from the inductor, the weaker the field becomes. And when we disconnect the current, the energy stored in this field induces an electromotive force, EMF, in the coil and is converted back into electric current. In fact, the CDC converters are based on these effects. Now, if we take a regular coil, the field around it will look like this. It's similar to the pictures of magnets you might have seen in school. The field lines exit from one end of the coil, loop around it, and enter from the other end, closing the loop. Let's start with simple coils. I wound two simple coils, and printed a frame for them on a 3D printer to make them as identical as possible. Overall, the model is SOSO, not, I wouldn't recommend it, but thanks to it, the coils turned out almost identical. Five turns with twisted pair wire. The inductance turned out to be about 69 hundredths of a microhenry. I assembled a simple stand. I took a K155LA3 chip and built a square wave generator on it with a frequency of 400 kilohertz. I talked about generators on logic gates in this video. The link will be in the description. I feed the signal from the generator to the base of the BD139 transistor. I install one coil in the collector circuit. I connect the second coil to the oscilloscope. Then I start moving, so to speak, the receiving coil relative to the transmitting one. I record the signal on the oscilloscope, and then process all of it. In total, I chose several characteristic positions. The first, and the worst, is when the coils are directly above each other. In this case, we essentially get an air core transformer. Let's take a look at the magnetic field lines of the coils in this arrangement. During the simulation, I powered both coils with the same current, so the field lines correspond to two energized coils. It can be seen that it's as if the two coils have merged into one. The field lines exit from one, pass through the second, and then return back to the first. And during the experiment, we get the highest induced voltage. Now, let's rotate the coils into the same plane. Let's conditionally call this position, side by side. It can be seen that the field of one coil conflicts with the field of the other. That is, a strong interaction occurs. Now let's try moving the coil by one, two, and three radii, recording the values. The following graphs were obtained. The red one represents the induced voltage when one coil was placed on top of the other. Next, according to the colors of the rainbow, orange represents side by side closely. Yellow is side by side at a distance of one coil radius. Green is two radii, and blue is three radii. Now we change the position of one coil relative to the other. The conditional position is crosswise one. We also move the coil away, take the graphs, and obtain very similar results. And if we look at the field lines, we can see how the coils strongly interact with each other. We have one more option for the orientation of one coil relative to the other. Let's call it crosswise 2. In this position, the field lines are distorted minimally, and looking at the measurement results, we get the minimal induced signal. And from this, we can conclude that regular coils are best arranged in this way, orienting their ends in perpendicular planes. A short commercial break. I repeated all the same measurements for coils with ferrite cores, which I desoldered from an old motherboard. The graphs turned out to be very similar for the cases of side by side, across one, and across two. However, I should note that for these inductors, the slightest deviation from the plane led to a significant increase in the induced field. Therefore, I think it would be more appropriate to secure them, for example, with sealant after assembly. Got it. So, the picture from the internet doesn't lie. As shown in it, that's how the coil should be positioned. 
and what should be done with toroidal coils. Let's figure it out. Here's what the field of a toroidal coil looks like. You can see that most of the field is inside the core and is closed. However, between the turns, the field emerges outside, like a beautiful flower. This means that the tighter the torus is wound, the less it radiates into the space. By the way, this is exactly why network toroidal transformers are shielded with a strip over the windings. Thus, the field that emerges between the turns will close on the shield and further radiation will be minimal. Well, if you place two toruses closely together, you get the following images. Next two toruses side by side. Position crosswise 1 and position crosswise 2. It is evident but the inductance fields interact. Well, let's move on to practice. We'll conduct the same tests as with simple coils. Only for the radius, we'll take this distance from the center of the torus to the edge. We get this kind of image for the position side by side, crosswise 1 and crosswise 2. The images turned out to be very similar. And if we generalize, it turns out that it's not very important how exactly the coils are oriented relative to each other when wound on toroidal cores. The main thing is to space them one radius apart from each other. That's quite sufficient. Next, let's look at shielded inductance in modern graphics cards and motherboards. Increased power consumption leads to an increase in the number of power phases, which have to be placed very close to each other, meaning the distance between the inductors is minimal. In such cases, special shielded inductors are used. I have an example of such an inductor from a graphics card. You can see that a regular coil is wound inside. However, around the coil, there is a ferrite, let's say cap, that covers it from all sides. As a result, if you look at the field of such a coil, you can see that the main field lines are precisely within the shield. And if we repeat our experiments, but with shielded coils, we will get quite obvious results. The induced amplitude is an order of magnitude smaller which is already at the threshold of my oscilloscope's sensitivity. And because of this, you can't really assess anything here. But roughly speaking, by using shielded inductors, you can leave a minimal gap and not worry the interaction will also be minimal. The main thing is to avoid direct contact of the shields themselves. And the last interesting point I wanted to demonstrate to you is the effect of the shield on the inductance value. Look, we take an inductor and wrap it in foil. We see how the inductance value decreases. Therefore, when designing filters, it's important to consider whether the device will have a metal casing. If this point is not taken into account, the frequency characteristics of the filter may shift due to the shielding casing. That's why in various high-frequency units, the adjustment screws for tuning are positioned so that they can be turned outside the shield. Because if everything is adjusted and then the shield is put on, all the tuning will be thrown off. And returning to the question, so how should inductances be properly positioned? I made this picture for you. On the left, in a column, it repeats images from the internet for regular coils, and these same rules apply to coils with cores. On the right, I supplemented it with toroidal coils. The main essence of the rule is to leave a gap of one radius between the coils and everything will be fine. Friends, I hope you enjoyed the video. I put a lot of effort into it and did a lot of work. I would be glad if you give it a like and write words of support in the comments or just share your thoughts on the topic of the video. Subscribe to the channel. Take care of yourself and your loved ones. And this was Andre with you. Goodbye.